Okay, here we go. So now, water potential. We have this cell that has a negative water potential because it has solutes inside of it. And so what happens if we put it in a solution that has an even lower water potential? Where does the water want to go? Um, the water, as we see, will always go from where there's more of it to where there's less of it. And there's more of it inside of the cell because there's less solute inside the cell than outside. And so this cell is going to be inclined to lose water until it equilibrates with the surroundings. As you can see, the inside of the cell will equilibrate. Now, if we take that same cell and we put it into just pure water, pure water has, there's no pressure here, there's no solute, so it has a water potential of zero. What's going to happen there? Well, there's, per unit area, there's more water on the outside, so it'll flow in. Well, the cell, because it has a fixed size in the cell wall, the solute doesn't change, but the pressure changes. All that, that water coming in will create lots of pressure and um, enough pressure to eventually, essentially equilibrate with the outside, but what you're really changing is the pressure on the inside, that component of the water potential. And as you recall, if we throw some terms on here, when we put this cell into this solution, of course, they're not isotonic at first because the cell we're putting in has what has less less solute, so it would be the hypotonic solution inside it, and it would be hypertonic on the outside, and so the water flows from the hypotonic to the hypertonic. And the <clears throat> opposite here, the water on the outside would be the hypotonic solution, and inside would be the hypertonic, and so the water flows in, again, attempting to reach equilibrium. Okay, so let's focus on water a little bit here. So the roots absorb the water, and um, we do this by solute concentrations to draw that water in. It's more concentrated on the very inside of the root than on the outside, and the plant will control those solute concentrations to draw that water in. Water can take a couple different routes. It can pass through cells, or it can kind of go around the cells, between the cells, um, along the cell walls. However, there is this um, uh, cylinder of cells that surrounds the very center. It's called the uh, endodermis here. And what it does is it has a waxy material that surrounds the cells and prevents water from going between. And so the water is basically forced through the cells. Uh, the plant, in essence, er, wants to do this because it wants to be able to control the flow of water, and when it's going through the cells, it can do that more easily than when it's just sort of going around the cells. And so this epidermis or endodermis forces the water to go through these cells. All right, uh, we'll come back to this slide in a second, but uh, let's look here. So how does water get up the plant? Well, essentially what we do, what the plant has is decreasing water potential as you move up the plant. And so you can see water potential in the soil has a negative value, but not terribly negative because there's not the, the water in the soil does not have a whole lot of solutes in it. It has some, but not a lot. But inside the root, it's slightly more negative. And then going up the plant through the trunk and into the leaves and the air spaces in the leaves and then the outside, we get a progressively more negative water potential. And water wants to flow from where there's a lower water potential, I'm sorry, a higher water potential to a lower water potential, or a less negative to a even more negative, okay? So this differential in water potential is what basically draws water into the plant and up the plant. And so the air surrounding the leaf is relatively dry compared to inside the leaf, and so that essentially draws water out of the leaf into the air spaces inside the leaf and out of the um, cells inside the leaf. So there's this constant movement of water from those cells to the air spaces outside, which draws water out of the vascular tissue, which then draws water up the vascular tissue and draws water into the roots out of the soil. Okay. And what allows it to move up really high? Well, if we remember the nature of water, that water 
is sticky. It's a polar molecule. And so you get this constant flow up these xylem vessels of these water molecules that are basically stuck to each other because of the polarity and are being pulled up the plant, you might say. <clears throat> okay, so it's being drawn in and then pulled up the plant. All right, here's another example where we're going to move water around. So here's those guard cells of this uh, stoma, this opening. And so when it's open, then gases can flow in and out of the leaf, and between, including water can then evaporate out of the leaf, or can lose it through transpiration is the official term when plants lose water this way. All right, so now the plant's getting dry. It's doesn't have quite enough water, and so we don't want to lose any more, so we're going to close the stoma. Well, how are we going to do that? What the plant does is it pumps ions, these red dots here, potassium ions, out of the guard cells, and then the water follows. This plant leaf, we say, uh, this plant cell, these guard cells become what we say flaccid. They don't quite have as much water, so they're not as, as um, rigid, you might say, and so it causes them to collapse down on each other and close the stoma. Again, we're moving ions, and the water just follows along. Okay. Now, phloem. So in phloem, we're not transporting just water with a few solutes. We're transporting a highly concentrated sugar solution that is made during uh, photosynthesis. And so these sugars are relatively large molecules, and they have to get some help crossing membranes. And so... What you have is, in particular with these companion cells, they're going to use co-transport to pump sugar, uh, sugar molecules from where they're being made into the phloem. And we're going to concentrate it there. And then what happens is, so now we're pumping this sugar into these phloem vessels, these sieve tubes. And so now when you get all this sugar in there, that lowers the water potential, which then will do what with water? It'll draw water in from the surrounding cells, and that's what we have going on here, water coming in. That creates pressure inside this xylem, uh, this, I'm sorry, this phloem vessel, and basically forces the water to move. So what we do with phloem is we pump the sugar in, the water follows, it creates pressure and forces this sugar solution to go moving around the plant, and in particular to move to cells that are sinks for the sugar, where there's less of it, and we want to store it there. So we have sources of the sugar where it's being made, and we have sinks where we want to store it inside the stem or in the root, for example. All right, uh, chapter 37, just briefly, nutrition, soil. So the basics of what a plant needs again, you need some carbon dioxide, um, you need some water and some minerals to help the plant grow. And we get the water and the minerals from the soil and the carbon dioxide from the air. We give off water through transpiration. Uh, and we also release oxygen. We have to tape again oxygen through the roots again and give off CO2 there. And here's that example I was talking about with um, plants growing in an aquatic system. Here are some mangroves. So this would be a saltwater situation. And so their roots are down here. And again, um, it's hard for them to get enough oxygen with that uh, water there. So what these um, swamp, like uh, bald cypress and swamps and these mangroves do is they sometimes have these, these projections that come up out of the water off their roots, and they're called nematophores, and they allow oxygen to diffuse down into the roots through these things called these nematophores. So that's a <clears throat> good adaptation to an aquatic existence for a plant. All right, we'll focus on this too much, but you can see some of the major uh, elements, uh, these macronutrients that plants need. Of course, obviously, they need carbon in the form of CO2. Um, they get oxygen, um, hydrogen. So these are the major nutrients that they need, potassium, et cetera, and then some others they need even relatively uh, smaller amounts. So the soil is the substance in which the plant is growing, and it's anchored in it. But the soil is also very important for supplying nutrients to the plant. And good soils will have lots of nutrients, in particular certain ions, potassium here, and C, copper, magnesium, um, calcium, etc. And um, 
So what happens is the soil particles, particularly if they have a decent amount of clay in them, will have a charge, and they'll tend to hold on to these ions. Okay. But what the plant will do is, as you can see here, it'll release hydrogen ions, and this is what's called exchanging the ions, and this is called cation exchange. And so the plant is giving up some ions to get these other ones that it needs. And so a soil that is good for growing plants will be described as having a good cation exchange capacity. It'll have the ability to do this very readily, lots of these ions that it can give up to the plants. <clears throat> there it is, cation exchange. And this is very important for not only wild plants, but for agriculture. And so you find farmers growing in soils that have good cation exchange capacity, good plant growing properties. Okay, so um, when we talked about the nitrogen cycle, we talked about these bacteria that are very important for taking nitrogen out of the air, and here we see these nodules with these bacteria growing in them on these the roots of the roots of this plant. And so, as we I think talked about, they're taking nitrogen out of the air, converting it into ammonia. And this is a form that plants can use, and then other ones converted into nitrate. This is also a form that plants can use, as you see here. And so these bacteria, these nitrogen-fixing bacteria, are extremely important for allowing or making nitrogen available to the plants. Because again, N2 is a relatively inert gas, and it has to be converted into these forms. Now to complete the cycle, you have these denitrifying bacteria that will decompose dead things and convert the nitrates back into nitrogen gas, put it back into the atmosphere. <clears throat> Here are those mycorrhizal fungi, very important for plants, increasing the surface area that they can explore in the ground to absorb more water and nutrients, and growing here in between the cells, sometimes again into the cells of the plants, depending on the type of mycorrhizal fungi, but again the goal is the same to get that plant some more water and nutrients. <clears throat> Reproduction of angiosperms in particular. So there's the flower. We saw that a little earlier. With the male part of the flower, the stamen. The female part, the carpal, sometimes called the, um, the, the pistil, consisting of the stigma, the style, and the ovary. Stamen consisting of the anther and the filament. And so here we have, again, we're in the petal and the sepal. So here's our flower your typical flowering plant. Plants are often bisexual. They have both male and female. Uh, the ovary, as we'll see, is what contains the ovules, which is where we have the female gametophyte and where we'll produce the seeds. The ripened ovary will develop into the fruit. The anther produces the pollen grains. And so here's your basic life cycle, this alternation of generations, where we have these haploid um, generations, the gametophyte <coughs> generation, excuse me, and then the diploid sporophyte generation, pollination, getting the male gametes, the pollen grains, over to the female part of the plant so that the sperm nuclei can get down to the um, ovule here where the egg is. <coughs> excuse me. We get fertilization, produce, production of the zygote which develops into the embryo, which grows inside the seed, the seed contained within the fruit, often used for dispersal of that seed. The seed gets to where it can hopefully grow, and then you get the next generation. All right, <clears throat> so here are the gametophytes. Again, with angiosperms, you'll recall this, that they're heterosperous. We have the microspore, which develops into the pollen grain, and the male gametophyte, and then the megaspore, which develops into um, the female gametophyte, otherwise known as the embryo sac. Uh, pollen grains have a tough outer covering, and they have um, two sperm cells inside them. We'll see how that's interesting. Inside the ovule, we've got the development of the embryo sac. And um, gosh darn, I'm just out about a time again. So I'm going to have to go to a third video, and we'll pick up this and talk about Double fertilization next time.